What are some words and phrases that indicate deception? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we proceed, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In today's video, we're going to analyze a segment of an interview John and Patsy Ramsey did with Barbara Walters back in 2000 to look for certain phrases, words they use that indicate to me that they are lying. This is part of an ongoing Ramsey series. So if you like this video, you'll love these ones. And the link to the playlist is in my pinned comment on this video. Without further ado, let's watch. 911. Yes, I did. It would have been impossible to sit there and wait by ourselves. You also called friends to come up. So in my last Ramsey's video, we actually watched the first five minutes of this interview. And we found a lot of problems, especially with that one response that John just gave here. So Barbara asked him uh, why they called 911 when the kidnapper letter said, if you call 911, we will kill your daughter. And I pointed out that he answered in the hypothetical, which we do not expect from someone who's telling the truth. They also did not second guess their decision to call 911, even though that could directly have been the precise reason the kidnapper killed their daughter. And I posit my theory is that they didn't regret doing that because they knew John Bonet was not actually kidnapped because they wrote the ransom letter themselves as a cover up. But in my comments on my last video, lots of my eagle-eared subscribers noticed that John actually said he called 911, when in reality it was Patsy who called 911, and we've actually analyzed that 911 call in my video, How to Analyze a Kidnapping. So that's another odd part of his response. So it was hypothetical, contextually it didn't make sense. Because you'd think they would be debating that decision, regretting it, accusing each other. But they don't do any of that. And John said he called 911 when it was Patsy. What does this indicate to us? I think that they are lying about calling 911 because they were panicked, because they weren't actually panicked. And I think by John claiming he called 911 it sort of indicates that he's playing fast and loose with the facts. So being direct and honest is clearly not a priority here. Otherwise, he could simply say, Patty, uh, Patsy called 911, not me. ...that they were being watched. The note said, if you do anything, if police come, if FBI come, uh, your daughter will die. Mm -hmm. You called 911. Yes, I did. It would have been impossible to sit there and wait by ourselves. You also called friends to come over. Was that wise? Your mm -hmm. daughter is gone. Desperate. She's Desperate. in the hands of a madman. Listen to what he said. Your daughter is gone. Or did he say our daughter was gone? This is important. Wait by ourselves. You also called friends to come over. Was that wise? Your mm -hmm. daughter is gone. Desperate. She's Desperate. in the hands of a madman. Your daughter is gone. What's wrong with that? He's posing once again it as a hypothetical. It's distancing. Why do that? It's easier to lie when you put things into the hypothetical, into the impersonal, because you're not placing yourself into the lie. So he's basically answering Barbara Walters' question like it's a hypothetical. Your daughter was kidnapped and you called your friends over. Was that wise? Well, Barbara, picture it this way. Your daughter is gone. Instead of talking about something that allegedly happened to him, my daughter was gone. My daughter was kidnapped. I didn't know what to do. I was panicking. That would be a reliable response. First person, past tense, direct, talking about a decision he made. Does all this mean he's a liar 100%? Of course not. We need multiple signs of deception. And I gave a long caveat about that in my last mechan uh, my last Ramsey's video. Four words liars use, so I'm not going to do it again here. 
and, and you reach out for any help you can get. Also, the other thing is look at the conclusiveness of what he says. So your daughter's in the hands of a madman, which is weird. And the fact that he said your daughter instead of my daughter. But then he says a madman as if he knows for a fact that the kidnapper is a male and the kidnapper is working solo because that's not what the ransom letter said. The ransom letter said that we are a group of people, a small foreign faction, something along those lines. And I've picked that letter apart in my other video. So it also said that two men are watching your daughter. Like two guys are watching her. They don't particularly like you, something along, along those lines. So the fact that he's saying she's in the hands of a madman could indicate that he's playing fast and loose with the facts, right? He's not trying to be precise in what he's saying. Or it could be leakage that he knows that a man, one particular person, one guy, one male, was responsible for John Bonet's death. And right now, my top two suspects this far into the analysis are Burke, John Bonet's older brother, who was nine at the time, and John Ramsey himself. Patsy is third on my list. However, she's still on the list. And lots of you pointed out in the comments that I shouldn't eliminate Patsy as a suspect just because of mo she's a mother. And that's true. And that is a bias I have. For me, um, it's very difficult to imagine a mother killing her own kid. It's harder for me to imagine that than imagining a father doing it or a sibling doing it. So it's a bias I have. I'm aware of that bias. Um, and of course it does happen, right? We've analyzed Casey Anthony on the channel, who I'm convinced killed her daughter. So it does happen. And uh, I am aware of that bias I have. So Patsy is still on my list of suspects. Unlike my McCann's series where I'm very solidified in my theory about what happened, this one is still malleable. I can still change my mind and I'm trying to keep all options open still because we've only analyzed one interview, the kidnap letter, the phone call, and now we're analyzing this interview. Friends to come over. Was that wise? Your mm -hmm. daughter is gone. Desperate. She's Desperate. in the hands of a madman. And, and you reach out for any help you can get. One more thing here, just with this response, and I know I'm picking apart all of their words, but it's because they are not good liars, in my opinion. They're unsophisticated liars. Your daughter is gone. Gone is another way to say dead. So even in this hypothetical, your daughter is, he cannot bring himself to say the word kidnapped. That might be because he knows it's not true. And it's a lot harder to tell a direct lie. So instead of saying, my daughter was kidnapped, he puts it into the impersonal you, your daughter, and then he can't even bring himself to say the word kidnapped. Your daughter is gone. Because his daughter was not kidnapped, his daughter was dead, and gone is another way to say dead. And this goes back to an overarching point around deception detect detection generally. If someone wants to deceive you, 99% of the time, they will do it by omission, which means that 99% of the time, people will just tell the truth, but they will hide the context. So you have to scratch beneath the surface just a little bit to expose the lie. So here where he said, your daughter is gone, all that could technically in his mind not be a lie. It's not a lie at all. He's not talking about his daughter. And he's not even saying this hypothetical daughter was kidnapped. He's just saying, hypothetically, your daughter is gone. Barbara, what would you do? That's a very easy way to lie. You can get. Uh, if I have a regret, it's I didn't get more help that morning. Once again, the other part of deception detection, right? I'm trained in statement analysis. I teach lots of statement analysis rules here. The other part of it is just the ability to use your imagination and to have logic. What would a person in their situation do? 
The kidnap letter said, if you call 911, your daughter dies 100%. If you do not call 911, all you have to do is pay us a modest sum and you get your daughter back. Now, would I personally call the cops right away? Well, they called the cops at 5.30 in the morning. The letter said to wait between 8 and 10 a.m. I don't know if I would have waited. I don't know if an average reasonable person would have waited or if they would have called the cops. So I can't judge along those lines. However, I do know this. If I did call the cops and then my daughter was found dead, I would be kicking myself for calling the cops. Because the letter said, if you call police, your daughter dies. Why would I not think that my call to the police was the cause of her death? And here John says his only regret is that he didn't call for more help. Contextually, that doesn't make sense. And I think it's, again, because lying is so hard. When you're fabricating a hoax, it's virtually impossible to create an an airtight story out of thin air. And I said this in the last video. Even blockbuster movies with unlimited time to write a script, unlimited budgets, professional script writers, professional script supervisors, continuity advisors cannot create airtight scripts. Even the biggest blockbusters have plot holes. And right here, John has a massive plot hole. The ransom letter said, call 911, your daughter dies. They call 911, their daughter was dead. Yet they do not even consider that their calling 911 was the cause of her death. Why? It's a plot hole. They weren't actually in that situation, so they can't even imagine that that's how they would feel. And that's a glaring, big, red flashing beacon of a red flag to me. And I don't think other people have ever pointed it out. You also called friends to come over. So notice what he says. His only regret is that he did not call for more help. In my opinion, massive red flag. The regret should be, I regret calling 911 so quickly or asking Patsy to call 911 so quickly because I will never know now what would have happened if I had just waited till 10 a.m. for the phone call. Was that wise? Your daughter is gone. Desperate. She's in the hands of a madman. And, and you reach out for any help you can get. Uh, if I have a regret, it's I didn't get more help that morning. The police searched your house, but they didn't find John Benet. But at one point, you went downstairs and found an open window. Yes. A window that you had broken yourself at one point to put your hand through and, and uh, uh, find the latch. Right. That window was in a storage room at the rear of the house. It was on the other end of the basement from the room in which John Benet's body would later be found. What did you think when you saw this open window? I was a bit alarmed, but I was more alarmed with the Samsonite suitcase that was standing up below the window. I have seen the actual police photograph that was taken of that window and the suitcase, and, and there it was in full sight. That looked wrong. That suitcase did not belong there. It was out of place. It was out of place. So you thought perhaps the kidnapper had gone through that window? I, that was my first impression, yes. Seven hours after the police first arrived, it was now around 1 p.m., the police asked you and a friend to search the whole house again. At that point, you opened the door to the small room. Tell me about it. I knew instantly, instantly what I'd found. I'd found my daughter. And it what did was, you see? I saw her lying on the floor with a white blanket. She was lying on a white blanket. Uh, her hands were tied above her head. She had tape over her mouth. Her eyes were closed. I immediately knelt down over her. Another caveat I try to bring up a lot of times is I do not analyze body language. So I'm sure there'll be a bunch of comments. Well, he sighed <sighs> before he answered and his eyes looked off to the left and uh, he hunched forward. That means he's lying. No, right? If you're actually recalling discovering the body of your murdered daughter, I'm pretty sure you'd sigh and slump your shoulders and tear up a little bit. And this is what my big issue is with body language analysis and why on my channel, I don't tolerate it. I, I block out 
uh, body language. And typically what I do is when I'm actually analyzing something in depth, I don't even watch the video. I just listen to the voices because body language can be so misleading, right? If someone does something that um, reveals their true emotions, that doesn't necessarily mean it's deceptive. If I sigh and hunch forward, it could just mean I'm sad. I'm recalling something sad. doesn't mean I'm displaying a secret hidden guilt. So for me, body language is a, a big uh, red flag. There might be some benefit to it, like Ekman and uh, the micro expressions. However, in my opinion, the risks outweigh the benefits. The chance it will lead you down the wrong path by even considering it is too high. It's better to ignore it entirely, in my opinion. So here where John sighs and slumps forward and blinks or whatever he does, we need to ignore that, at least over here on my channel, because we want to get to the truth. And the truth comes through people's words, because that's how we've evolved to communicate and how we've evolved to deceive. And I just want to make a caveat about this because I see so many comments, you know, well, we've evolved to use body language. Yes. If I smile, it means I'm happy. If I fold my arms, yes, it can mean I'm angry. But besides that, it doesn't really tell you much. I could be angry because I'm telling you the truth and you're not believing me. Or I could be smiling because it's duper del duper's delight or just because I'm happy to be on TV. So it leads you down too many wrong paths. And I am working on my deception deck, which I announced in my last video. Uh, and that should be for uh, ready for sale soon, where I will basically teach you my favorite, easiest to grasp statement analysis techniques as playing cards, um, as flashcards. So you can learn them for yourself. And that way you can be quicker at picking up problems with people's words rather than resorting to what I consider to be voodoo body language analysis. Felt her cheek, took the tape off immediately off her mouth. I tried to untie the, the, uh, the cord that was around her arms. I couldn't get the knot untied. Um, it's cool. thought she was dead. Uh, Did you scream? I screamed. I picked her up and I ran upstairs and I, I, I... Let's go back. He said he tried to take the cord off of her arms before the cord around her neck. Is, is that odd? Yeah, I think so. I think if I found my daughter tied up on the ground, the first cord I would reach for is her neck or I would shout her name or try to wake her up or something. But I think, does this mean he's lying? No, it's just a bizarre reaction. And if enough leakage or red flags pop up to me and I'm convinced that John murder John Bonet, then I'll come back to this and think, hmm, maybe he took the cord off the hands before the neck because he wanted to take the cord off around her neck in front of everybody so he could have witnesses for them to see that he had his fingerprints on everything because he was taking it off, not because he was applying it. Uh, her hands were tied above her head. She had tape over her mouth. Her eyes were closed. I immediately knelt down over her, felt her cheek, took the tape off immediately off her mouth. I tried to untie the, the, uh, the cord that was around her arms. I couldn't get the knot untied. Um, it's cool. thought she was dead. Uh, Did you scream? I screamed. I picked her up and I ran upstairs and I, I, it was like a dream when you, you scream but you can't say anything. All you can do is scream. That's what I did. You and put, yes. I took her upstairs. And Notice how he's, none of this is hypothetical. Well, you find your daughter and uh, you carry upstairs. All this is first person past tense because it's true. He is the one who discovered the body. He might have done all these things, which is why he's relaying it so Precisely, as we would expect someone who's telling the truth. Like I said before, 99% of lies are by omission, by leaving out stuff, leaving out context. The context here might be, I knew she would be in that room, 
and I knew I should leave the rope around her neck, the, the garrot, um, around her neck so that I could remove it uh, in front of everybody upstairs. So just because what he's saying here sounds truthful does not mean that he's innocent. It just means he's relaying something that actually happened. The context he could be leaving out is the incriminating context. And, and laid her on the floor and, and uh, still had a hope that she was alive. I remember walking in and seeing her lying there in front of the Christmas tree. And I looked at John and he said, she's dead. And it's nothing felt real. I felt like it was... Um, It felt like it was a play. It felt like it was staged. Here, nothing felt real could be leakage because she knows it was not real. This was all a performance for the benefit of the police. By that same token, could she be innocent and her saying nothing felt real be totally benign and, and uh, honest? Yes, right? I'm just pointing it out because this stuff is cumulative. Leakage is cumulative, which means that the more you see it, the more important it becomes. And if you've seen my McCann's playlist from my first video to my most recent video, you will see how we have accumulated leakage regarding nautical references, nautical expressions, nautical words, where other words and expressions would have been just as appropriate, which is textbook leakage. That nautical, water-related stuff is coming to their minds whenever they talk about Madeline's body because they're actively trying to suppress uh, the image of her in the water, in my opinion, in a cold, dark place. So it comes out through their words. Like here, if Patsy knew this was all a performance for the benefit of the police and they were playing roles, saying none of it felt real is appropriate because it wasn't real. My life was in slow motion, and this was not really happening. It was in slow motion. This was not really happening. John said it, it felt like a dream. It felt like it wasn't real. Could all this be the leakage that this was not real? Yes. Could all of it be benign? Yes. But I'm pointing it out because if we see this echo throughout the rest of this interview, our future interviews, them talking about how this wasn't real and felt like a performance or felt staged or felt like a dream instead of a nightmare, which was a weird thing to say. Nightmare would have been a much better word than dream. Uh, but anyway, then I will continue to point it out. So leakage is cumulative. So in the comments, some people say, well, you know, they said this expression, you mean that, that they buried Madeline in water? No. Right? That, mean, that means you're new to my channel. It means you've watched one video. I point it out because once we've seen it 20 times, we can stack up about 20 poker chips and start feeling more comfortable going all in that this leakage means something. And even in one of my McCann's videos, you guys saw firsthand leakage coming out of me. Before I wanted to reveal what I thought actually happened to Madeline, um, I actually leaked it through my own word choice in one of my early McCann's videos, and you guys caught it in the comments, which was impressive, right? Even I am susceptible, susceptible to leakage in a very low-stress situation, right? Sitting at my desk recording a video. Imagine the stress of being on live TV, talking to Barbara Walters, trying to suppress stuff from your memory while inventing stuff while recalling things you made up in your short-term memory and constructing it to talk about something you invented while omitting what you actually saw or what you were actually thinking. It's very complicated and creates a circumstance where leakage is more likely to occur. I knelt down over her and just laid my body on her body and my cheek against her cheek and it was cold, and I just kept saying, no, no, you know, ask God. Ask God to raise her. 
Whoa, whoa, whoa. What did she say here? Just laid my body on her body and my cheek against her cheek, and it was cold. And I just kept saying, no, no, you know, ask God. Ask God? Ask God to raise her. Ask God to raise her. Odd. John Benet's body was stiff. She had apparently been dead for hours. An intricate noose apparatus called a garrote was tightly pulled around her neck, cutting into the flesh. She had been strangled to death. An autopsy would later reveal that John Benet had also suffered a skull fracture, the result of a blow to the head. This is the big wrinkle in this case, that there were two methods which could have killed John Benet. One was bludgeoning, so getting whacked hard on the head. And one was the more intricate method of execution, which is the garrote, right? So uh, a rope with two wooden handles and you wrap around someone's neck and you pull it tightly and you strangle them. Um, and depending on which one killed her, it affects the just the contextual analysis. Do I think... For example, that John Benet could have strangled his daughter to death. No. Do I think Patsy could have done it? No. Do I think Burke could have done it? Maybe. Right? Children don't exactly have the same understanding of consequences of things. So let's say he learned how to make a garrot in uh, the Boy Scouts and decided to use it on his sister because he was angry at her or because he was playing around and wanted to test it and didn't understand what it would do to her. Um. That's a possibility. So I'm not throwing out any potential suspects. However, if she was bludgeoned on the head and then the garrote was used to make this look like a mafioso execution, basically to bolster the kidnapping story, the bludgeoning could have easily be done, been done by anyone. For example, if Patsy had whacked John Bonet on the head with a wine bottle in a drunken uh, you know, drunkenly falling down the stairs or stumbling and, and knocked John Bonet in the head. Or if Burke whacked her in the head with a flashlight, I think lots of people said in the comments, um, is a possibility. So depending on which method actually killed her helps uh, raise the possibility of certain suspects. And as far as what I've seen in the limited background I've done on this, either one of them could have been the, the COD, right, the cause of death. I don't think the coroner actually determined conclusively that the bludgeoning was the cause of death or that, that the garrote was the cause of death. And even if it was a cover-up, the application of the garrote is, is pretty sick for a parent to do, to go that far um, to, to protect yourself or your son by actually tying something around your, your dead daughter's neck. However, if they were doing it to protect Burke, I could see that, right? Burke accidentally kills his sister or does it on purpose. And they think to themselves, this is going to follow Burke for the rest of his life or even narcissistically, right? This is going to reflect poorly on me if my son's a murderer. So let's cover this up, pretend it was a kidnapping. I'll get the guy wrote, I'll tie it around her neck so it looks like a mafia hit. And uh, we'll just lie our asses off for the rest of our lives to protect Burke. And if they're narcissistic, to protect our own reputations as well. So all possibilities for me are still on the table. However, I'm leaning towards Burke did it by accident and the parents covered it up. And had been sexually molested. What had begun as a kidnapping case for the police was now a brutal homicide. The police stayed with you all that day and the following day. The sexual aspect of it is also another wrinkle in the case because I'm not sure how solid the evidence about that is. I think that was circumstantial evidence. I don't think it's as conclusive as they're leading in this documentary. However, if it is conclusive, um, then it points more towards the father. The father or basically the father and then uh, him covering up and, and tricking everyone else. 
but I'm not sure about that aspect. And like I said, I've done limited background on this. The police, just like the Amanda Knox case, which we have a series on, and the McCann case, which we have a series on, bungled the forensics and the investigation. In all these unsolved mysteries, the police always dropped the ball. They fumbled. And uh, you, you felt that, that you were under their protection because yes. you didn't know where this killer might have been. Uh, but it turns out that they were really scrutinizing the two of you, that you were already suspects. Did you have any idea then that you were suspects? No, not, not, no. not at all. It was reported also, Mr. Ramsey that shortly after you found your daughter's body, that you called the pilot of your plane to arrange a flight to Atlanta. Is that true? I did. We had um, been asked to leave the house. Within minutes of that happening, the police took the house over. We had nowhere to go. Atlanta was our home. Uh, we lived in Atlanta for 25 years. That's where our family was. We wanted to go home. During the day that your child was found, and in the day's fall. Is them flying to Atlanta within a couple like hours or something of finding their daughter dead? Strange. Maybe, yeah. But remember, these are very wealthy people. They had two private jets and a yacht. A private plane is almost like taking a taxi cab to their you know, in-law's house to stay. I don't think it's as big as a deal as some people make of it. It's strange. It's pretty cold. Pretty cold thing to do not to want to stay there. I know for me, I would probably want to be there and assisting as much as I could, the local police, to catch the person who did this. But um, I don't think that this is so incriminating as people make out. Even if John and Patsy Ramsey are cold people, and they would have to be cold people to cover up this crime and to put the garrote around uh, John Bonet's neck. Even if they're cold people, does not mean that they actually killed their daughter. So we have to escape binary thinking. And I think that's one of the reasons people piled onto Amanda Knox so much because she is unlikable. She's cold. She says weird stuff. Same with the McCanns. They're cold, they're stiff. They're, if you do body language nonsense, they look like they're lying. But that doesn't necessarily mean they did it. Now, in the case of the McCann's, I do think they did it based on my statement analysis and all the context of things they said in certain contexts where it's bizarre. So based on logic, I think so. But um, the Ramses, I never fault people for lawyering up. I think even if you're innocent, it's the right thing to do. Um, I don't fault people for using scripts when they're doing a speech, right? So if they write down what they want to get across in pleas for help. And um, in this case, taking a private jet around to them was probably not that big of a deal. And they could easily come back if they requested to. Um, so I, I, I won't look into that too much. I think it's kind of a non-issue. But let me know in the comments if you think that is is so damning. I personally don't see it. I'd rather, I think there's way better evidence that this was a cover up than them getting on the plane. Following Mr. Ramsey, there were reports from the police that you didn't seem distraught. You weren't sobbing. You seemed stoic. It, it was said you two rarely talked to each other. To them, this made it look as if you were guilty. I've heard that, and I find that uh, unbelievable. Uh, I, I've lost. Once again, him being stoic doesn't mean he's guilty. No, that might, he might be a narcissistic, sociopathic guy. I've seen lots of comments like that. Right? He's a narcissist. He's so sociopathic. It doesn't mean he killed his daughter. It could explain partially how he had the, um, the fortitude to cover up the crime to protect Burke. And if he's a narcissist and a sociopath, you know that he's very concerned about his image. So it could explain how he, when he saw John Bonet dead, he thought, okay, she's dead. Nothing we can do about her. Let's protect Burke. And could be very matter of fact. I think Jerry McCann might have the same sort of um, demeanor. Doesn't mean he killed his daughter, but it could explain why he took charge when she was dead and told Kate, 
Look, there's nothing we can do for Madeline. She's dead. What we need to do now is focus on our family unit and make sure that this stigma does not uh, follow the twins and make sure that we don't get locked up for neglect and get locked up in a Portuguese prison and have the children go into foster care. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say it was a kidnapping. I feel like John, uh, John's stoic, non-emotional demeanor does not make him a killer. Same with Jerry McCann. I don't think it makes him a killer. However, that type of personality could stay cool-headed enough to orchestrate a cover-up. I've lost two children. And uh, for someone to tell me that I didn't act right, uh, I don't accept. There is the impression that from day... I agree. It's weak. You didn't cry enough. Right, body language. You didn't cry enough. You're guilty. Okay. I'm now I'm crying a lot. You're crying too much. You're trying to be too persuasive. You're guilty. It's it's too weak. It's too subjective. If you want to paint him as the one who did it, body language will let you paint someone any way you want, which is why I think um it's so weak and actually very dangerous if you're trying to get to the truth. Listening to pe- what people say actually tells you what's on their mind actually shows you what they're trying to uh, hide by not mentioning or by addressing something and try to refute it before you even brought it up and can also reveal through leakage what's really on their mind what they're picturing at the time they're talking under stress you can also even get inadvertent confessions embedded confessions like we got with uh, Nadia in one of my early videos Um, so if you want to see that, watch my, uh, video. It's one of my first videos. Did Nadia confess to cheating or something along those lines? Day one, the two of you refused to cooperate with the police. No, that, that is a, a media myth. Uh, we met with the police on the 26th. We met and with talked them with them. For, and talked with them. Talked with them for hours on the 27th uh, when they asked us to come to the police station. We said, you know, yeah, we want to keep working with you, but can't you come here? We can't go out. Patsy was in bed. Patsy was barely able to move. And all we asked was they come to come here. They said, well, no, we have paperwork at the police station we might need to get a hold of. Okay. On the 27th, a very good friend of Them not cooperating with the police is strange but like i said i don't necessarily fault them for that especially if an attorney told them not to talk because unlike the mccanns their daughter isn't allegedly still out there right and she needs to be found so any information they provide to the police will be useful at this point their daughter's already dead and if they have any idea of how the real world works and i think john and patsy do know how the real world works they know that they are suspects So lawyering up and not being cooperative to protect themselves from being wrongly convicted is actually a smart thing to do. So in their case, it's a no-brainer to loyal up and not necessarily help because their daughter's already dead. Yes, they want to find a killer, but not at their own expense. Whereas the McCann's not answering 48 questions when their daughter is allegedly kidnapped and still out there is a much bigger red flag. That's an important distinction. There's lots of similarities between the Ramseys and the McCanns, which are two of my favorite subjects right now, and which are two of my most popular series right now. But the difference is, in the Ramseys case, they know 100%. Everyone knows the daughter's already dead. So the decisions they can make in the public are different because the McCanns' daughter is allegedly, according to their narrative, still out there. So in their case, the McCanns, you would expect a lot more cooperation, which when you don't see it, is more of a red flag. A friend of yours, Mike Bynum, said to you, I think that you should hire lawyers. Mike knew things that were going on that we didn't know. He, he knew that the police by that time were withholding John Bonet's body for burial. He also, based on his experience as a prosecutor and as a district attorney could see that the police were very quickly focusing on us as the killers. 
Yeah, so Mike, his buddy, gave him good advice. If I knew him, I would also tell him to lawyer up. Your lawyers advised you then not to submit to police questions. Why not, people say? Wouldn't you have wanted to tell them everything? Well, I don't recall that our lawyers told us that at the time. Uh, we were perfectly willing and anxious to work with the police to find the killer. We had a higher priority at that point, and that was to bury our daughter. But it would, in fact, be four months before the Ramses would sit down with detectives for formal interrogation. See, lots of people who don't know anything about how the legal system works think this is extremely damning. If they didn't cooperate for four months, in reality, any defense lawyer would tell you not to cooperate at this point. Not to say any, because it is true. The Miranda rights are true. Anything you say can and will be used against you. So even if they didn't kill their daughter, and even if they didn't cover up the crime, let's say it was actually a kidnapping, which I don't think it was. Let's say it was actually a kidnapping. They still should have lawyered up because at this point, John Bonet is already dead. The police are going to point the finger at them. The prosecutors will go after them. And the less you cooperate, the less info you give, the less they have to use against you. So I personally think that one of them, one of them killed John Bonet, and then both parents worked together to cover it up. That's what I think. However, do I think that their decision to lawyer up? is a red flag. No, you should always lawyer up. And just as a bit of advice for my followers here saying, should I get a lawyer? And this is not legal advice, right? I'm not giving you legal advice. However, I'm just telling you how things work. Saying, let's say the police are interrogating you. Should I get a lawyer? Do you think you need a lawyer? That's not a request for a lawyer, right? So officer, do you think I should get a lawyer? The police We'll probably, like I said, do you think you need a lawyer or no? We're just asking you some questions. In order to invoke your right to an attorney, your right to silence, you have to demand an attorney. I want a lawyer. I want to call my lawyer. Now you've actually invoked your right and the questioning should stop. So just be aware of that. The Ramses here got good advice. I don't think them... Uh, being, I don't think them not cooperating is such a red flag. Whether they're guilty or innocent, it was the right thing to do. There was a mutual distrust between the Boulder Police Department and the Ramsey family. Why didn't you take a lie detector test? No That's one ever asked us. Really? To take a lie detector test. Police never asked you to take a lie detector no. test? No. I was asked during my interview with Steve Thomas a hypothetical one of the questions. Policemen. One yeah. of the policemen that uh, investigated this murder. He said, if I were to ask you to take a lie detector test, what would you say? And I said, I would be offended. That's what I would say. I wasn't interested in proving my innocence at that point. That, that we was were a non-issue. There's a murder loose. Mr. Ramsey, would you now take a lie detector I test? I would, certainly. Would you, Mrs. Ramsey? Yes, I would take a lie detector test. Yes, I would. So stuttering is another sign of deception. See, I think I have that in the, the cues section of my deception deck. But stuttering or saying um or hesitating or changing a response midway through the sentence are all signs of deception. And like I said, you need multiple signs of deception. But stuttering over one's words usually indicates that they're trying to avoid a slip of the tongue. So it could mean that they're lying. Or it could just mean that they're sensitive about the response. So here where Patsy stutters about being willing to take a lie detector test might indicate that if push came to shove and she was actually sit, asked to sit down and do it, she would say no. So listen again to the stutter. She hasn't stuttered this entire interview. Murder loose. Mr. Ramsey, would you now take a lie detector I test? Would, certainly. Would you, Mrs. Ramsey? Yes, I would take a lie detector test. When you realized that you two were the prime suspects, what did you think? What did you feel? What did you say? Well, we were, we were outraged. We were, we were shocked. How could they think that? Mr. Ramsey, the police officer that day, Linda Arndt, said on this very program that when you put your daughter's body down, you looked straight into her eyes. His face was just inches from mine. 
And Linda Arndt said she felt then from your expression that the killer was in the house and she was afraid of you. Well, we have a body language analyst head detective, so I'm not surprised that this case was fumbled. Even though she might have been right, the killer was in the house. I, I think she's right about that. I just don't like the way she came to that conclusion. I do think either John, Patsy, or Burke was the killer, and I ranked them in this order. And remember, this series is just beginning. We're only four videos in. Trust me, by the time we get to 10 videos in, and I've analyzed some interviews of Burke alone and John alone and Patsy alone, we'll crystallize this theory a lot more to where I'm more confident to go all in on my opinion. That said, I ranked them this way. I think Burke did it and John and Patsy covered it up. Second place, I think John did it and John and Patsy covered it up. And then third place, Patsy did it and Patsy and John covered it up. So I don't think either parent fooled the other parent. I don't think it was a solo thing where one parent committed the murder and orchestrated the cover-up to fool the other parent because they both um, answer things deceptively and have leakage that reveals that they know that they're being deceptive about this kidnapping story. The question I would ask Linda Arn, has she ever looked before in the eyes of a father who has just been told his six-year-old daughter is dead? Exactly. And John answers it perfectly. Let's say he had a weird expression on his face or his pupils were dilated like a wild animal. Does that mean he's the killer? No. It could just as easily mean he's uh, going through some insane emotion because he just found out his daughter was dead. Which is why body language to me is so weak at spotting deception. Right? If, if someone's frowning at me, yes, I know they're angry. Right? So we do express ourselves through body language. Right? If I do this, maybe I'm more confident than if I you know, am cl closed off and um, folding my arms. But body language is not a good way to detect deception. It's a good way to communicate overtly obvious things. So on that note, we're about uh, we're 13 minutes into this interview. We will do another part where we analyze uh, the rest of it. Uh, but right now, I want to take some time to look at some of the top comments from my previous video, just so we can highlight some of the best stuff from the subscribers, some of the things that were voted up to the top, because I think you guys make lots of great points, and I want to make sure we're all uh, able to appreciate that, and I'm able to respond to it here so we can all address it together. So here we have the top comments from my last Ramsey's video for four words liars use. So the top comment from Fiona Lyons, I absolutely agree that Burke did it out of temper. Apart from their need to protect their son, there's also the damage to their reputation as parents. Questions would be asked. Another similarity to the cans is the parents' lack of cooperation with police. And I agree. I think that even if the parents are very cold and uh, let's say both parents are narcissists or sociopathic, it would still explain why they would protect Burke because if their son was found to be a murderer, it would reflect poorly on them. So there's a benevolent reason for protecting their son, right? John Bonet's beyond help. She's already dead. Let's make sure Burke's life isn't ruined too. Or the selfish reason. Well, Burke killed John Benet. There's nothing we can do for her. If if Burke is found to be a murderer, we're going to look terrible. The stigma will follow us for the rest of our lives. It's going to reflect very poorly on our reputation. So let's cover it up. Right? So my theory that the parent that Burke didn't, the parents covered it up doesn't necessarily mean that the parents have to be these super loving parents that would do anything for their son they could still protect Burke for selfish, um, narcissistic reasons. Even if they're both sociopaths or psychopaths, yet their own personal reputation would be affected. So it would still make sense to protect Burke. Second comment from D. Zules, your channel is now my absolute favorite on YouTube. Every video is so interesting and informative. I used to be obsessed with other body language analysis channels, but I much pref prefer the linguistic analysis approach. 
it makes a lot more sense to me than blink rates and other obscure signs of deception. Please keep making these videos and I'll be getting the deception deck. Thank you, D. Zulez. And I agree. I think body language, let's say someone is trained in it and is able to freeze frame micro expressions, that may be useful, right? So I'm not saying there's necessarily zero use to body language. But to me, body language analysis, micro expressions, etc., is about as useful as um, a lie detector. Very rarely in life will you have the chance to sit someone down, ask them questions, record their expression, and then go back through and analyze all the micro expressions they make during their response to tell if they're lying. Or like a lie detector, very rarely in life will you have the chance to sit someone down in a chair, hook them up, get a baseline, and then ask them a bunch of yes or no questions to determine if they're lying or not. It's just not practical. It's not useful for me to teach you how to do that on YouTube. We've evolved to communicate with our language. And even if you think, hey, we evolved to communicate with our bodies, in today's world, most of the communication we do is through words, whether it's through speaking face-to-face -face, or watching a news report and trying to tell whether or not the anchor is lying or the person they're interviewing is lying, or even analyzing text. All right, so this rules of statement analysis as well as the contextual stuff I point out still applies to text. For example, if I wanted to analyze uh, Kate McCann's book or the Ramsey's book, I could do that, right? Because it's written out, they still have to use language. Whereas body language would be totally useless there. Same with a lie detector. They're just not particularly useful and they're wrong too much of the time. Right? If someone's blinking a lot, Maybe they have something in their eye. Maybe they're just stressed. Maybe they don't like the interviewer, so they want to block them out. Doesn't mean they're lying. It's too obscure. All right. Third comment. Also, regarding the deception deck, I announced this in my last Ramsey's video. I secured deception detect doc, uh, deception deck com because you guys expressed so much interest in it, and I'll keep you posted when that's ready. And what it will be is basically flashcards with my favorite rules, rules that you can practice and learn so that you can spot these things on the fly the same way that I do. Hollyweeds. At Hollyweeds. It never made sense a kidnapper didn't have the note ready in advance. They knew where to find a pad of paper and pen in the Ramsey house and spent 20 minutes composing a three-page letter while trespassing in the house. Right, right, right. I agree. A kidnap, that note, that ransom note, in my opinion, is 100% fabricated, and it was written by the parents. Based on the language in it, which I analyzed and how to analyze a kidnapping, based on the context that it was written with stationary from Patsy's desk, and Patsy's pen, and and um, it when uh, investigators tried to write it out by hand, they said it took like twenty minutes to write that thing out. Very unlikely, an actual kidnapper would a write a note that long, or b break into a house without the note prepared. It's just not how kidnapping works, and I've been suggested to make a video comparing the Ramsey ransom note to genuine ransom notes. So let me know if you want to see that. The same way I, rec I compared um, the McCann's press conference to press conferences from parents whose children were actually kidnapped, right? A one-to-one -one comparison. So let me know if you want me to do that, where I compare the Ramsey ransom note to ones that are confirmed genuine, where they were really written by kidnappers, and you will see very big differences between those. At Gwen Boland, the stick used to tighten the garrote was the handle of a paintbrush that was owned by Patsy. The handle was broken off and the rest of the brush was neatly put back in the box. Fibers from Patsy's sweater were found under the tape over John Bonet's mouth. Patsy helped stage the body. 
I'd always believe. So also, I don't know if all this evidence is true. The other thing is, let's say some fibers from Patsy's sweater were under the tape. It doesn't necessarily mean that Patsy applied the tape, right? If if the kidnapper was rolling JonBenet's around on the floor, she might have collected some hairs and DNA on her mouth, and then the tape secured those in. So all this evidence um, in this case, I, I rank it very low, just like I do in the Amanda Knox case, because the CSI techniques that uh, they used and the, the, the quality of the evidence they collected was very weak. Right? John Bonet was killed in a house where she lived with her parents, with John, with Burke, with Patsy. So finding their DNA and fibers and stuff like that isn't uh, that big of a deal to me. The same way that the, in the Amanda Knox investigation, they tried to make such a big deal about Meredith's blood and Amanda's blood being in the sink. Well, they both lived in the house. If they both had uh, bloody gums or something, it's very simple that they might both spit into the sink and their blood get mixed. So when it comes to DNA stuff or small little fibers, I don't uh, put too much stock into it especially when the murder occurred in a place where all those people lived. Astrin Maris also noticed that John claims responsibility for the phone call immediately. He states firmly, I did, even though Patsy is the only one talking during the call. Does anyone else find this curious? And that is a nice catch from Astrin and that's why I addressed it in this video, because lots of people pointed this out in the comments. And I think I was so focused in the last video on pointing out small uh, little lessons and details that I actually missed that very obvious thing where he claimed responsibility for a 901 call that he did not make, which basically indicated that he was playing fast and loose with the facts. Matthew Oliver the deception tech, the deception deck would be great. Please continue working on it. It will be so valuable for myself and I assume a lot of people. And I told them deck coming soon. So if you are interested in that, please let me know in the comments of this video. The way I'm gauging how much time to invest in it is how many comments I see from people expressing an interest in getting it so I can allocate more time to it. it it's about the same amount of effort as writing a book. Except with the deck, you're going to get, you know, 52 flashcards. So we can dispense with all the filler it would take to pad out a book. So you just get the straight rules, examples, explanations, etc. So you can use them. And I think it would be fun to hold up the cards while we're recording when I'm pointing out a specific rule so that there's a little visual interactive element to the videos. And I like the interactive element of my videos and doing the analysis publicly because of the feedback I get. So as I said in this video, right, I do have biases. Everybody has biases. And by doing my analysis publicly, at least I can have people giving me their opinions, pointing out my biases, pointing out things I might have missed. And it actually makes the analysis a lot richer and stronger. Which is why I wanted to do this feature here. And if you like this feature where I highlight comments, let me know. I think it's just a nice quick way to get extra points in to the analysis after my feature presentation uh, that, that I didn't have time to organically work in. And these are all upvoted comments. So they're ones that you guys clearly find interesting and have voted up to the top of the pile. All right, this will be the last one here. Happy one to, and then I see one from Alicia who's a member of the channel saying another vote for the deception deck. Brilliant idea. Thank you, Alicia. If you're not a member, uh, you can become a member by clicking the join button. There's a link in the pinned comment of every video. So in every video, I have the link to the full playlist of that subject. So in this one, I have a link to the full playlist of DD versus the Ramses, as well as the link to become a member. And that's in the pinned comment. So if you want extra bonus content, do consider becoming a member like Alicia 
And I think we have almost 100 other members of the channel. So thank you to everyone. All right, this will be the last comment for today. Happy 123, Sophia. As I always say, it's not what people say. It's what they don't say that gives them away. Guilty people try all kinds of avoidance to say what really happened, but give themselves away so easily if you listen carefully. Yes, she's basically reiterating the point of uh, lying by omission. If you're listening to the dog that's not barking, if you're listening for the dog that doesn't bark, you can catch lots of, lots of lies, right? They'll bring up stuff they're comfortable talking about, but they will not mention stuff they didn't consider. And in this video, an example of that was them not saying they regret calling 911. That should be something that weighs on their mind every day for the rest of their lives. If we didn't call 911, would John Benet still be alive? But they don't express any regret. And actually, John specifically said he doesn't regret that because he said his only regret was not calling for more help. Why? Because lying is hard. You have to think in four dimensions how someone actually in that situation would react, which is very difficult to do. So guilty people do try all kinds of avoidance, and I'm going to, that will be some of the, uh, the cards that we're going to do here. Things people say when they're trying to minimize or avoid telling the truth, words that indicate someone's speaking vaguely, or words that even indicate that someone's lying by omission. And if you've seen all my videos, that's the good thing. If you've seen all my videos, you have all this stuff for free, right? The cards are just a fun way to make it more interactive. It's not like I'm holding any knowledge back. I give away everything for free on my videos. Um, there's nothing I haven't told you that, that I know um, that I'm hiding from you and trying to sell. Right? I even show uh, the uh, images of the member section on these videos just so if you can't afford to become a member or, or you know don't know how to sign up, you still see what they're seeing too. Right? It's totally optional. All right, thank you for tuning in, everyone. My last Ramsey's video is Zooming, so clearly this has struck a nerve. People are interested in it. So please do let me know if you want uh, me to continue this uh, series. The next one will continue to analyze this interview with Barbara Walters because I think it's very rich in content. Until next time, stay true.